Hello, everybody, and good evening. I am your host of The Readout, Joy and Reed, and today we're going to be taking a deep dive into critical race theory, but not the leftist opinions that I normally spout. Today we're going to have an anti-CRT advocate and researcher by the name of Christopher Rufo. Christopher, thank you for being on The Readout It's great tonight. to be with you, Joy. Uh, Chris, first question for you. Why do you hate black people? Joy, you told me these are going to be softballs. I know. This is how we get you on the show. Okay. Well, this is awkward now. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let's talk about critical race theory, Christopher. Can you even define what critical race theory is? No, I can't define it, uh, but I do know it doesn't exist. But oh. if it did exist, it should be in every public school in America. Oh, thank you so much for it, for admitting that, Christopher. I didn't have to pull teeth and interrupt you this entire interview just to get you to say that. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, what's the next move for you with critical race theory, Christopher? Oh, you know, um, it's to 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 invent it. Uh, that's still one of the things I'm working on. Uh, oh, yes. To plant evidence in all of these public schools and then to report on it uh, in the most salacious and inflammatory way possible, um, so that parents who also don't know anything about critical race theory can be fake mad about it mm. all over the country. Wow, uh, Christopher, I must say I, I'm very impressed with the the hundreds of curriculums that you have faked, the videos of parents going to school boards that you have faked. You've really hired tremendous crisis actors, and and you've really created a, a fake movement across the nation. So I'm very proud of That's you. That's right. That. I mean, the moon landing, uh, yes. you know, Bigfoot. Critical race theory, these are all things that are fake and definitely not real at all. <laughs> and scene, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Will and Amla Live. Will's here as well, although he could not play Joy Ann Reed. I don't think it made quite sense. <laughs> I very much could have played Joy Ann Reed. He's got the hair. He's yeah, got the hair. Exactly. Yeah. Really? Do you have a John Oliver, not Will? You could do the John Oliver. Oh, let's yeah. give it a shot. I'm John Oliver. Oh, wow. <laughs> Talking about Chris Rufo. <laughs> oh, amazing. Ugly <laughs> brother. Crocodile Dundee. Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, my. That's close enough for government work, right I think. Out. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, so we have Chris Rufo on the show today. Welcome to the actual show. Great to show. be with you. Great to be with you. <laughs> uh, we're going to be going through, really, his highlight reel of angry leftists coming after him, all the different corporations, schools that he has exposed through his work and research on critical race theory, and we have a special special announcement at the very end of the show that I'm sure of all people, Joy Ann Reed is going to love the most. So let's stick around for that. Uh, Chris, you were recently attacked by a one Mr. John Oliver, and I'm sure you've seen this a multitude of times now. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I've seen it. And, and you just told me just before we started that it's got 5 million views. It's really an yes. amazing thing. He First episode of his new season, it's a 28 minute essential essentially like a profile of my work Yes. Um, with the kind of MSNBC style talking points interlaced into it. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, a lot of these uh, uh, events are, are great because the reality is that the more people hear about critical race theory, the more they talk about it, uh, the more they reject it. Right. And so a lot of these attack pieces, um, uh, I, I, I think ultimately boomerang. Yep. Um, and, you know, I don't think he scored any points on this one. I Twenty-eight always, minutes. Uh, yeah, always boomerang. I yeah, mean, we had the same thing with Samantha B with Prager U. They okay, did, she did a whole segment on Prager U. This was Taylor. Were you around for this? I was like just. I remember that a just couple years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she did like a segment about Dennis and him being fat and stuff, and did a segment about me being stupid. All it was great. <laughs> it was great. But but the way that it works is that these people try to yeah. corner you or say something about you, and they can't actually refute the things you say. Yeah. So all it does is make it a boomerang, exactly like you said, that makes people come out of the 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 shadows and say, "Wow, I actually support everything this guy's saying." Yeah. Because they didn't offer any sort of refute. And they're, you're elevating the debate on our terms, essentially. Right. I mean, they're, they're playing defense on critical race theory, um, but that also then presupposes that we're playing offense. Mm -hmm. And so these maneuvers, I don't think, are really, are really persuasive to people. And we know from the polling data that parents of all racial backgrounds, a majority opposes it. And right. so it's only, you know, kind of the Acela Corridor, kind of uh, media, in, intellectual policy people who are really convinced that this is good, mm -hmm. but normal everyday parents in every community in the country are saying, hey, wait a minute. Obviously America has problems. America has a history of racial injustice. You know, we're not gonna do kind of a candy cane treatment of this where everything right. is great. But the idea that you can say, no, no, everything is evil and wrong and we should separate kids on the basis of race, that we should, uh, 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 you know, be judging kids on the basis of their of their ancestry mm -hmm. is not good. We don't want it. 
Nobody wants it except for the John Olivers, you know, and the Kim Crenshaws of the world. Yeah. And before we get into this John Oliver video, I'm sure people are going to find this. And, and maybe there will be a few of you who do not know what critical race theory is. Uh, can we first have you explain the leftist view and the, the, the view that John here purports of what critical race theory is versus what's actually happening in our schools and institutions? There's there's two kinds of definitions. There's the euphemism. Mm -hmm. The euphemism that they like to use is that critical race theory looks at uh, race and racism uh, as it's codified and practiced in American institutions and interprets racial, racially disproportionate outcomes uh, as a function of embedded white supremacy. That's, I mean, that's true. Critical mm -hmm. race theory does do that. But if you actually read the literature, which is available, you can buy it on Amazon, you can look it up in, on the internet, yep. you can read all the papers, um, most of them for free you realize that critical race theory is not just that, um, but actually it goes a, a few steps further. Critical race theory, first of all, is an explicitly uh, Marxist or neo-Marxist philosophy. They use Antonio Gramsci, the Italian communist theorist, as one of their touchstones. And then they take this, uh, this old Marxist class conflict idea between oppressor and oppressed, which used to be in economic terms, mm -hmm. the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, uh, upper class, lower class, 1%, 99%, whatever, whatever language you want to use. And they say, well, that really isn't what we're looking at. We're looking at oppressor and oppressed based on racial characteristics or uh, racial history. Um, and the solutions that they come up with are not, you know, uh, teaching honest history, which is another euphemism they like to use. Their solutions in their own work, don't have to take my word for it, is severely restrict the First Amendment so that any speech that's deemed racist by the government uh, or our expert class is no, is no longer legal. Mm -hmm. So your podcast, sadly, if the critical race theorists were, were in charge, would be kind of gone. Um, Angela Domla, she's black. They don't. Yeah, that's not going to help you. Yeah, that's that. There's there's a. <laughs> they have interpretations to uh, dance around that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, individual rights, property rights, all of these fundamental uh, principles in American law, American constitutional jurisprudence. Um, they say, no, no, no. These are all fundamentally uh, to, to maintain white racial domination. Mm -hmm. We can't have uh, uh, true justice unless we abolish private property, capitalism, individual rights, and freedom of speech. The way that you say this, I mean, when you're talking about racism and, and the white kids versus the black kids and this stuff, and then it goes deeper when you're talking exactly like this. I mean, it, it's like Selin Alinsky's rule for radicals, like straight out of their textbook. And it's like, you're talking about property rights and free speech and things. That doesn't seem like it has really anything to do with racism in the grander picture when it, or capitalism, you know, dismantling capitalism. Do you think that when these people who are the institutors of, of this whole this whole critical race theory nonsense in our society right now, do you think that the real goal is equality of race or do you think that it really goes down to the Marxist ideals of, of power over over people? I think I think there, there, I think it's both and the critical race theory the thing to know about it contextually is that it's a post civil rights ideology. So in 1964 and the 1965 with the Voting Rights Act, um, you have legal equality. So the promise in the Declaration, the promise of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War was finally enshrined into law as a system of colorblind equality where each individual is protected regardless of race, gender, ancestry, et cetera. But critical race theory, the, the, the fundamental turn is that they said, this still hasn't provided substantive equality. So there are still racial disparities, which yeah. is true. Mm -hmm. but, but the lesson that they draw, which I think is false, it's not a good conclusion, is that, okay, we have equal rights but we have unequal outcomes. Therefore, equal rights is insufficient. We need to actually have positive racial discrimination to forcibly put the thumb on the scale to gain equal outcomes by race uh, at the end. So for them, I think truly, and I, I take them at their word, they really do want racial equality, mm -hmm. which is a noble goal, but they don't think you can get there unless you get rid of capitalism, individual protection, private property, et cetera. Then you would never have equal races because then you would have to bring another race down if you had to do that I mean, bringing white people down in a sense if you're saying oh these people you're taking away the first amendment to be able to say something well that means that they're going to take away white people's ability to say anything that might be considered offensive or racist in any sort of context and 
you can never really have that type of equality in that type of system. In in broad in broad terms, yes, but it's even there's even more wrinkles than that because it's not just bringing white people down. For example, Appalachian Americans so are are one of the poorest groups mm -hmm. uh, in the country. They're white. Nigerian Americans are obviously black. They're from Nigeria and they're one of the richest groups. Uh, and then wealthier than all of them, all of the major kind of four or five racial groups uh, are Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. Are Asian Americans white? Uh, are they non-white? Where do they fall into this? So when you actually look at the data in a more complex way, you realize, you know, something like seven out of the top 10 wealthiest uh, uh, ethnic groups in the United States are non-white. Um, if you look at African descendants of slaves, it is truly a, a, a lower down the socioeconomic ladder for legitimate historical reasons and causes, which you should we should obviously try to rectify as our society. But this idea that you can reduce everyone to a very simple black white dichotomy where you are by nature either oppressor or oppressed, it doesn't speak to people's real experience. When you actually go into the world and look at it in a real embodied way, it's more complex. It's it's messier. It's very difficult to say um, that, well, we should treat you this way because this is what you look like and treat you this way because this is what you look like in a multiracial country that's rapidly changing with Asians and Latinos, for example, right. and then and then affluent, highly educated immigrants from Africa, for example, it becomes unwieldy. And the better system truly is to say, let's look at individuals rather than try to manage the different racial outcomes mm -hmm. through these brute force policies. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, a city that got a shock with that was San Francisco because they ousted three board members. I know you probably saw that in their education system because they were pushing this sort of anti-meritocracy. Meritocracy is an extension of white supremacy. And when looking at the voting stats on that, it was Asian Americans who galvanized and said, no, we're not going to go with this. And they're often a forgotten group in much of these discussions. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, Asian Americans are taking the charge on CRT as well right. in Virginia, in, in New York, in San Francisco, places where there's I mean, there aren't conservatives. Mm -hmm. There are not many conservatives in San Francisco right. or New York City. But these are folks who are not necessarily intellectual conservatives in the sense that, you know, maybe we are thinking mm -hmm. about it in those terms and mm -hmm. policy politics. These are people who say, hey, wait a minute, from a practical point of view. You're going to get rid of advanced math courses. You're going to get rid of magnet, magnet high schools. You're going to get rid of standardized tests where we can measure performance. And you're going to get rid of any kind of merit-based system of admissions. Just from the practical standpoint, we reject this and we're mm -hmm. going to fight against it. Right. You know, this is a revolution. I tweeted about this the other day. It's a revolution in normal people. I did an anti-rally or anti-mandate rally a couple of months ago or about a month ago. And it's just these people aren't domestic terrorists or radical extremists or whatever they want to label us yeah. as these are just normal people yeah. who say i'm fed up with this That's, the, the the next election is going to be decided by the parents and yeah. the normal people who are fed up with just this extreme leftism i mean just you're talking about polling before polling shows that the social justice left is not that big of a a wing of the left but these people are the loudest they're the loudest and they're very good at what they do they mm -hmm. wield power beyond their actual constituency in a very sophisticated way and Again, it's it's the critical race theorists. They've studied Gramsci. They look at that kind of uh, cultural politics. They talk about how to uh, gain power in elite institutions. They look at how they can game the system uh, of hiring, of, of HR, of uh, training programs. And so they have their little cadre of people that goes around and intimidates others. Um, but there's only so far that you can push people I think Americans are by nature, by, by, by nature, fairly polite. Um, and if you look at most people, okay, well, we'll do this, we'll do that. You know, all right, when this is a little nutty, but fine, we'll do it. We're going to be very polite about it. Um, but when you start saying, well, we're now going to go after your kids, um, those polite people, those normal people are going to say, you know what, you're crossing a line now mm -hmm. and you're going to have to pay a price. And so we have this really amazing reversal where in 2020, the kind of defund the police, uh, BLM, Antifa left felt like we run the show now. Our people and our policies are in charge. Um, surprise, surprise, they aren't feeling that anymore. And there's a sense that they're really 
uh, in a position of, of weakness. They're on their heels. They've been obliterated. You know, think about how amazing it is. 2020, you had something like tens of billions of dollars of private philanthropy money sinking into the BLM affiliated causes. You had the entire media, universities, medical establishment really towing that line. Um, and the, the one policy that they coalesced around, their one great idea was defunding the police. Right. I mean, this is a group that, I mean, that that's political malpractice. Yep. If you were a doctor or a lawyer, you would be disbarred. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's like the level of power that they achieved was astonishing and then they squandered it. And so I hope that you're right. I hope this is a revolution of normal people. And I hope that we can then build on that constituency to say, hey, wait a minute, we're going to now push a bit back into the institutions. You're sounding a little bit too logical here, Christopher. So we're going to have to bring this down a little bit. All here's, right. <laughs> here's John Oliver talking about you and the work that you've done with critical race theory. And to be clear, CRT is graduate level legal theory. So unless your five year old is currently pursuing a law degree, they're not reading Kimberly Crenshaw. But critics of it argue that the ideas behind CRT are being taught in schools and often present. Oops. I always play these quickly. Let me put it normal. Your Great. brain just works so fast. For I us. just I don't even too notice much it anymore. A version of what those ideas are. And a key person here is this man, a conservative activist named Christopher Rufo. Good picture. He claims yeah. CRT is actually <laughs> a revolutionary program that would overturn the principles of the Declaration and destroy the remaining structure of the Constitution, which it just isn't. It isn't that. But in the wake of the George Floyd protests, just as America was beginning to grapple with systemic racism, Fox News began featuring Rufo on air a lot as part of their efforts to swing that pendulum back hard. And in one appearance, he pointed to diversity trainings in government as evidence of CRT's influence. And he spoke directly to President Trump through the camera about what he wanted to see happen. The president at the White House, it's within their authority and power to immediately issue an executive order abolishing critical race theory trainings from the federal government. And I call on the president uh, to immediately issue this executive order and, and stamp out this destructive, divisive, pseudoscientific ideology at its root. Now, did Trump see that? I don't know. Is the Pope a Catholic? Is the reason Big died the fact that Carrie didn't call 911 fast enough? The answer to all those questions is yes, and also, she was right not to do it. No big loss. Because Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff, has since revealed President Trump saw that interview, and when Rufo said, I call on the president to immediately issue this executive order, quote, that's what we did. We okay, <laughs> let's pause there. Wow, lots to unpack. What was your initial reaction when you first heard that John Oliver had covered you in this 30-minute segment? You know, I, I had a, a window into it because the producers called me the week before to do some fact-checking. I mean, oh. some fact-checking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it could have been worse, uh, honestly. But, you know, I mean, the timeline is right. That's what happened. He's mm -hmm. giving a sense of the narration. But he's like, oh, critical race theory, revolutionary ideology, set to destroy this. Uh, it can't be that. Mm-hmm. But actually, in the book that he showed on screen, the red book, Critical Race Theory, uh, 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 the Writings of the Movement, mm -hmm. um, it's all in there. It's literally in there, but it's a 500-page book. Right. And none of the morons at John Oliver were able to like sit down and read it. Of course not. But had they done that, had they read the book that they literally put on screen, they would have saw, okay, restrictions on First Amendment, restrictions on 14th Amendment, overturning the colorblind principles of the deck of the of the Civil Rights Act mm -hmm. and an explicit uh, uh, call to overturn private property rights. I mean, the basic founding principles of the country. And so when you're destroying the First Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act and private property, guess what? That's a revolutionary program. Yes. And guess what? Even further, they explicitly say we're following the communist theorists revolutionary theorist Antonio Gramsci. And so it's like, John, don't take my word for it. Mm -hmm. Just do the homework. Yep. But these guys are, bi are are too busy running talking points for their, their favorite constituencies that they won't even do the homework because they assume that we are too dumb to do the reading mm -hmm. when in fact the opposite is true. But yeah. That's exactly right because they, you said they're morons. They are morons. True. And, and But they also expect that w the people who watch his show are morons mm -hmm. who have never seen a book before in their lives and they think, oh, I'm going to flash a book up on screen. That means I'm really smart. I don't have <laughs> yeah. to actually show that I read the book or yeah. anyone mm -hmm. here read the book. I can just show a book and that's enough for people. I would be willing to bet that they actually didn't even read or purchase that book. 
Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, they just, you know, looking Google through news PNG articles. And, uh, yeah, exactly. They, they, they switched. They they snagged the, the screenshot of it. And, yeah. uh, but, but but that's the thing. And, and ultimately, I think that's why they're, they're losing this fight mm-hmm. is because they're not willing to do the footwork. They're not willing to examine their own assumptions. Uh, and they're not willing to take seriously what millions of parents have seen uh, up front and personally. Yeah, they, but they don't have to take those things seriously. And I think that, at least for me, I'm sure you feel this way even more than me because you're doing this so much with the CRT specifically, that it is the belittling of the arguments just mm-hmm. over and over and over again. It doesn't exist. This isn't happening. They don't actually refute anything. I mean, that must be, for me, I would be very annoyed if I was you. If I, this just constantly kept happening. I was annoyed at first, um, but when I saw the poll, when I started tracking the polling data, I became unannoyed very quickly mm. because it turns out most people don't like being talked down to. Yep. Most people don't like being patronized. Most people don't like being talked as if they're a child or a, or a moron. And so they've taken these cute, uh, um, it's sophistry, right? It's, it's lang- linguistic lies and linguistic kind of hiding maneuvers, um, but it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And actually the polling data shows this huge surge in, in, in sentiment against critical race theory. And this next clip you're going to show, even, even Kimberly Crenshaw, the co-founder or even really the founder of critical race theory, says, you know what, we've tried the language games. We've tried to be cute by denying that it exists, but actually we're losing. That's a bad strategy. Um, these people, us, you know, me, uh, are going after us at a substantive level. And by just trying to pretend that it doesn't exist, uh, hasn't actually moved the dial in our favor. Right. And here is that clip from Kimberly Crenshaw. She's the one who famously says that critical race theory just purports that we should be teaching real history in schools. Yeah, right. Here's the clip. Do so, so I think that when we're caught in a, is it CRT or not CRT, they win. That, that's the whole point of throwing this in. And I have to say, it, it took a lot of folks a while to figure that out. Um, when this first started, I talked to a lot of people, um, diversity and inclusion, people who um, uh, were in K through 12, people who were teaching 16, 19. And um, to, to almost a person, they all thought, well, it really doesn't implicate me because I don't really teach that. And it's only at this moment where I think it's clear that it doesn't matter what it is you call what you do. If you're trying to center anti-racism in whatever you do, they're coming for you. They've, they've built this cage and they've put us all in it. Right? <laughs> so, so I think that when we're caught in a, is it CRT or not CRT? That's just amazing. You, you've put her in a cage. No, I, I mean, it, like, it, it's very dramatic uh, mm-hmm. metaphor, dramatic imagery, but it's no, cool. you have all put, you have built the cage. Yep. You've put yourself in it. They've built the cage for 35 years. Yep. Uh, we just closed the door. Exactly. We just said, no, no, you can have your thing. You can do your thing. It's right. fine. We're f- free Americans. Um, but this idea that somehow we invented it, I mean, she knows the truth. Yep. You can listen to her between the lines. She's saying, okay, the CRT, not CRT thing is kind of a bogus distinction. Mm -hmm. It kind of is all CRT. She even said 15 years ago or 10 years ago in a uh, in a paper, critical race theory has become like Kleenex uh, and tissue paper. It's become the brand marker for an entire range of K through 12 pedagogies, diversity training programs uh, and race based scholarship. And so she knows this. They tried to kind of hide the hide the ball game. And you, you don't get a sense of confidence from her. No. Um, and here's the thing. She seems like actually a very nice person. Uh, I bet you if, I mean, probably not with me, but I bet you if, if in a different world, if we had a <laughs> dinner together, it'd be very nice. She seems very friendly. She seems very genuine. Sure. She's a smart, a smart person. But look, you can't play. These are not ideas to play with uh, in, in, in a Petri dish somewhere. Yep. Uh, when you actually put them onto four-year-olds and five-year-olds and Contrary to what John Oliver said, I have documents from a third grade classroom in Cupertino, California, where they are explicitly teaching Kimberly Crenshaw mm-hmm. by name, mm-hmm. intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw. And so when you're taking them out of the realm of academia and actually putting them onto people's lives, you should expect that some people are not going to like it. Right. Um, and and, uh, and that there's this backlash, although I don't even consider it a backlash. I consider it really just a, a corrective to say, hey, wait a minute. 
this isn't what we want. This isn't what we want to be doing. Yep. Um, and, you know, but in a weird way, I even feel some sympathy for, for Crenshaw because she's built critical race theory over 35 years. Mm -hmm. Not many people had known about it. It was kind of under the radar. Um, and then we educated in the past 18 months, 175 million Americans right. that learned about critical race theory and they hate it. And so we, we kind of took her life's work um, and we crushed it. Uh, yeah. So that is very unpopular among the public. So mm -hmm. in a, at, at a personal level, not an ideological level, I feel no sympathy. Um, <laughs> but on a personal level, you, have, you feel some sympathy. You can tell even her emotion there. It's like, yep. oh my God, wh Overwhelmed. where is everyone? What can we do? We're, we're kind of getting crushed on this. So You're a better man know. than me. I feel no sympathy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yes, destroy <laughs> these ideas. Because you, know? uh, you see where yeah. these ideas lead. That's Especially right. when they come yeah. from Marxism and you understand what communist, communism yeah. and Marxist ideas have done to people, killing millions of people. Not saying that CRT is directly that exact same thing, but it's the exact same type of ideology where these types of things lead. Yeah. And so I personally feel no sympathy when someone who is pushing those kinds of things gets destroyed. I think it has to be done. Yeah. I, 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 and again, I think ideologically and, and, uh, Kind of politically and and then personally, I, I try to maintain that little shred of, of humanity mm -hmm. uh, at bottom. Um, and I think too, the other thing is, you know, um, John Oliver or or Jerry Reed or Kim Crenshaw or whatever, any of these folks that have come after me, I, I don't feel any hatred towards them. And uh, there's a great Confucius quote that I that I think about sometimes is, um, when you hate someone, they have defeated you. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have to be uh, different in how we think and how we feel and how we operate because people can see that from the outside. And uh, I try to have a, a light touch personally with a lot of these folks because That's fantastic. if it wasn't Kim Crunch, I'd be someone else, you know, and I'm not going to get wrapped up in getting mad about individual people. Mm -hmm. We have a job to do and we should be ruthless about it. I agree with you there mm -hmm. without having that uh, uh, feeling of hatred um, in our hearts, um, and I think that's why I think that's why this CRT move, anti-CRT move, has been successful. These people aren't haters; mm -hmm. they're not white supremacists; they're not terrorists. These are people who 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 are just everyday parents who want to have a good education for their kids. They want to have a stable job and income. They want to have their kids be able to do a little bit better than they did. Right. That's what most people want. I, I completely yeah. agree. And if you, yeah, when you recognize that, it makes these conversations a lot easier. And you've been known to meet any leftist who wants to talk about these things exactly where they are and do it. I, I want to talk about your tactics behind exposing CRT and getting these millions and millions of Americans educated, because really you're, you're the David in this David and Goliath story. And you had to come up against something that was massive and spreading very quickly. How did you start doing this? It's all about information. Um, that's the, the biggest lesson that I've learned in the last two years. Information has value. Information is currency. Um, and then by doing the investigative reporting, by doing dozens of reports over the course of time, um, I developed new information mm -hmm. that had, how can we describe it? News value that had was salacious. It was provocative. It was shocking um, because look, that's what makes news. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to play the news game with no reservations. Mm -hmm. I looked for the most egregious, the most shocking, the most horrifying examples. I framed them according to a counter narrative to use a CRT term. <laughs> um, and then I used this amazing uh, information uh, ecosystem that conservatives have built over the last five decades to quickly get the information in front of a lot of people, including the president of the United States. Um, and then when Trump touched it, as tr only Trump does, it became a national political issue. And then it became a fight and we had to fight very smart. We had to create language. I spent a lot of time figuring out how to communicate, how to talk, what words to use, what phrases to use, mm. and then trying to educate policymakers. I put it together a briefing book for legislators, governors, senators. Um, and then all of a sudden the phrases that I had developed all of a sudden are on Fox news. They're on social media. They're on the, the podium when governors are speaking and this really beautiful coalescing happened where the, the, the right got on the same playbook, went for it, channeled this parent energy, um, and then started turning it into policy. And so, um, that to me is more powerful than anything. Victory is, 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 uh, 
is what we're trying to do. You know, right. I don't want to like lose with dignity. Uh, I want to win with dignity, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and I think that once that cycle started to happen, once this stopped being uh, just an idea and it started to be an actual movement, that was just the, the, the best feeling. It's right. like, wow, this thing then takes on a life of its own and you just have to ride the wave and try to redirect it a little bit as right. you can. Uh, along the way. I got a call from a leftist family member about three weeks ago and they were just talking to me about what's happening in life and everything and she had gone to a hairdresser and she said, you know what, uh, aside from all this other stuff, I got to tell you that you conservatives are doing your jobs really well because I went to my hairdresser and I didn't know she was a conservative and then she started talking all about how we have to fight this thing called critical race theory and she's like, and it's not even being taught in schools, it's a <laughs> law theory, I cannot believe she's like, I need to pick a new hairdresser, amazing. <laughs> it is crazy. I mean, it really is crazy. Sometimes you talk to people, and, oh yeah, you know, critical race. You're like, wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like it, it, it has become a touchstone for people. It sounds um, kind of scary. It does. Just the yeah. word well, critical in front of it sounds very scary. Critical race theory. Race theory. Yeah. I mean, uh, you extreme know, extreme race theory could have been better. <laughs> extreme race. Yeah. Sounds more fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but race theory also. Hey guys, race theory um, in German, Rassen theory. Um, doesn't have a good sound to it no. you know like it's kind of like whoa let's let's come together in a pragmatic and practical way where we have r race relations in a lot of sense like how do we have a multiracial multi-ethnic society where we can all come together race theory is like it has such a bad connotation and ultimately like um, eugenics and, yeah it has that kind of vibe to it and and i think that's really um they made a fatal mistake in 1989, I believe it was, when they came up with the term critical race theory at their first conference. Because um, it's just, I mean, from a marketing standpoint, it's that you could not pick a worse and more alienating phrase mm -hmm. than critical race theory. So part of the power, and of this is like, uh, uh, part of the power of this movement is language. You can't attack, uh, and it's because it's a, it's a, it's a propaganda word. It's a euphemism. It's not real. Diversity and inclusion. Those are nice. I like diversity. Right. I like inclusion. I don't want to fight diversity and inclusion. Right. Critical race theory gives you permission. It gives you permission to oppose it. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're always should be trying to do is break the frame of our opponents. Never say, oh, you know, we really got to get rid of diversity and inclusion. Say, no, no, mm -hmm. no. I don't accept that. It's not about diversity and inclusion. It's really, truly not. Uh, I'm against critical race theory. Um, and I'm sure people watching this, I'm going to get beat up about this. They try to beat me up about this stuff all the time, but we should be honest about the techniques. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah. We need to teach conservatives how to be smart with words because right. conservatives oftentimes are, are verbally not as sophisticated mm -hmm. as the left. Um, and we, if we want to make headway, we have to change it. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you yeah, think I there is value of coming and saying, like, if they use, because the left controls all the words, you know, they change yeah. climate change, global warming to climate change, affirmative action, all these kind of things. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, you know. Is, so good. Like, like, how much value is there to actually use their words against them versus no value. Know, creating something? No value. Because, uh, and this is a big, maybe there, there's a debate on this, but I, I think that I'm 100% uh, on board with, you can't, you, it's like, nuh uh, you know, it's just like a nuh uh, mm -hmm. uh huh, nuh uh, like when my kids fight, nuh uh huh. <laughs> um, it's like, no, 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 you can't use their words against them or their concepts against them because then you're implicitly accepting the legitimacy and the framing of their mm -hmm. concepts. You can't say black lives matter, all lives matter. I mean, I get it, it's a cute play of words, but you have to say, defund the police. But do you think oh, that's, that a, that's using their words against them too. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a bad example, or <laughs> yeah. maybe I'm wrong. But you have to figure out, you know, y y we have to create our own engine, you know. Because yeah. um, when they say critical race theory and we say, oh, we're fighting against critical race theory. And they say, well, it's not critical race theory. It's diversity and inclusion. Yeah. And then you're kind of getting on a, a bad, like, because I do all these interviews with people mm. I got on the streets and I'll do one about socialism. And I'll be like also talking about communism. I'll be like, well, that's not communism. That's democratic socialism. And that's a great thing, you know. And so sometimes when you're when you don't have the same language reference, to e reference point, it makes it difficult to even start a conversation because no one can agree on terms. Well, I think that's yeah, true. Yeah. You but, start your conversations by defining terms, I think. And yeah. Like no, seeing where agreed. people stand yeah. and then, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I mean, you're going to have that problem. I mean, Fox, the vocabulary of Fox News is going to be very different than the vocabulary of MSNBC. Sure. Right. That's fine. 
the idea and and what the left has done very successfully they get their phrases which are always really masterfully constructed as the dominant phrases mm -hmm. so dei anti-racism black lives matter um you know uh love means love i mean like some of them are so childish it's like ridiculous mm -hmm. um that that famous black lawn sign you know the, mm -hmm. the blonde sign with the you know yes i just i walk by one of those human every rights day are, on my, are human rights i believe in science human is illegal yeah. they're good at it they're i mean great. they're good at it they're so good and they it's disguise so strong. all the ideas yeah. with yeah. things that sound, apparently sound good to everyone yeah, yeah. you know they do but, yeah they do yeah, I'm like, oh yeah i like that you know if you're just a guy walking down the street who's like well yeah science yeah science is cool yeah. yeah yeah love yeah love is love that's right, right. love is love right. you know right. they're tautologies right mm -hmm. i mean tautologies uh, it, it's like saying a is a b is b it's like they but create then a, a also uh, represents c d e they, f g yeah. but they don't say that yeah. mm -hmm. they create a closed logic um so our thing is to break into that close and maybe maybe i all right i take back my position maybe you can use the language against them but you have to do it in a way that opens up the language mm -hmm. you know so um Maybe that's maybe that's the the subtlety there. Yeah, yeah. I want to open it up. Let's uh let's switch gears here for just a second. Sort of switching gears. I kind of want you to explain how gender theory <clears throat> and critical race theory are linked because a lot of people are seeing these two different issues pop up in their schools and institutions at the same time and think that they're completely separate issues. How are they linked together? Sure. I mean, uh, the 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 idea that they're both critical theories. You know, a critical theory of race, a critical theory of gender. It's the idea that uh, a theory should not merely seek to explain or understand the world as it is, mm -hmm. but a theory actually should be an attempt to change the world towards some uh, utopian potential future state. And so what that means is breaking down, uh, uh, breaking down racial institutions, structures and ideas and concepts, or breaking down gender institutions, concepts, et cetera, so that you're trying to, uh, trying to uh, undermine uh, conventional, uh, and I would say uh, uh, kind of metaphysical mm -hmm. uh, realities so that you can change or subvert those systems that are really, uh, you know, men and women are complementary. That right. used to be pretty much a widely accepted uh, uh, truth. Well, actually, no, it's not that they're complementary. That's a disguise for male domination. We need to break that apart, you know. <laughs> and that, that's, that's basically it. I mean, yeah. it's, you know. And so it's two different axes, right? It's the same basic theoretical structure or framework, critical, a critical theory, that's on racial axis, that's on the gender axis, that's on other identity axes, that's on an economic axis. Mm -hmm. They, they find these lines um, where they can start running the playbook along those lines. And then the gender stuff, I mean, the race stuff, I don't know, kind of spitballing, but the race stuff is most obviously horrific. When mm -hmm. you're segregating kindergartners by skin color, it's like, guys, we've gone off the rails. Right. I think the gender stuff is worse. I think I the gender stuff is actually more destructive. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Right? Do you think so? Oh, 100%. We actually just had this discussion, I believe, yesterday on the yeah, show. Yesterday. Okay, yeah. tell me why. Yeah. Catch me up. We got a question from a, a, a viewer saying, you know, if you were forced to teach critical race theory or gender theory, which one would you rather teach? And we both said, you know, yeah. critical race theory, the gender theory has far more, like, implications when it comes to that young child's life. Point. And, yeah. you know, Damn, that's a good question. The, the rates of mental illness and suicide and things that can be attached to teaching young children this is very yeah, the horrifying. The sexualization of children. It's just a disgusting yes. thing. Yes. You know? Oh God. But it really goes down to the whole critical theory. I mean, this even goes out in the scope of art and everything. Everything is supposed to be subjective, which is so ironic because all of these people telling you that everything is subjective, everything can be criticized, they're the people who are making these objective rules. That can never be they, criticized. That can never be criticized. <laughs> very, isn't, very convenient. It, isn't that crazy? It's, it's so convenient. It is like, extremely convenient. Everything is up for debate except for what they say. Yeah. And that's just... I mean, that should just show leftists that it's it's about power. It's not about helping people. It's not about contributing to this. It's a, it's about power of the people who decide what is objective and what is subjective. Oof. And, and the gender stuff is, I, I'm just digging into it from a reporting angle, mm -hmm. from doing the kind of the homework, the background reading, because I'm interested. I mean, th as a parent of young kids, it's... It's intense. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, even in my little neck of the woods in, in Washington state, 
Um, even the the parents that I've talked to that are are liberal, these are Democrat liberals, kind of NPR listeners, right? Sure. Kind of NPR Americans. Um, they're behind the closed doors, uh, kind of in a quiet voice. They're terrified of this stuff. Yep. I had a friend, protecting an anonymity here, uh, a friend who sent uh, uh, his daughter to a choir camp. It's like a two week choir camp, um, like summer camp. They're uh, in middle school. And he says, uh, a third of the girls came back from camp, non-binary, queer, or trans in two weeks. Horrifying. And this is someone, this is not a random anecdote that some Anon told me on Twitter. This is a close friend of mine. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I had a chance to talk to him and his daughter about it. Um, it's like, that should be setting off red flags for people. Mm -hmm. um, and hey, look, like, if you're gay, if you're transgender, I lived in the Bay Area, I met a lot of transgender people. Mm -hmm. um, all power to you, do your thing. You're an adult, that's like your path in life. I'm gonna treat you with dignity and respect as an individual human being. Absolutely. It's quite different though, when you have people recruiting kids into it. Yes. Um, that strikes me as something very, very different. Um, and we really shouldn't have hesitation to saying, hey, wait a minute. In the same way, it's not even a, uh, it's not even a, uh, a kind of hetero or homosexual thing. It's not a question of that. Mm -hmm. If you have heterosexual people grooming a opposite sex child into some thing that is inappropriate, that's also bad. Right. Um, and I don't know. I, and apparently you worry about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If it's you know, the Catholic Church has obviously had problems with 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 the kind of child abuse. The public schools have even higher rates of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so you are as a parent, your first duty is protect your child. And this does create, I think, not only a, a uh, legitimate but also a rational uh, fear. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hearing it even from people who are on the left and even people who are transgender going, you know, I'm a fully grown adult who made this decision for myself. You should not be pushing this on children and having this discussion with them. And and speaking of just finding the most salacious stories, oh. you <laughs> put this one out on Twitter. Ooh. Let's read this one. From, can, uh, can you read it? Can you, are you allowed to use all the words? Yes, we can We can, We can. can read this one, I think. Oh, goodness, guys. You need guys. me to read it. <laughs> I think I can handle it. Outsource all the dirty words to Will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> honestly. So. so these women are running a sexy summer camp for children in rural Kentucky with lessons on sex liberation, gender exploration, BDSM, uh, being a sex worker, self-managed abortions, and sexual activity while using illicit and licit drugs. Wow. How did this story come to your attention? This story came to an attention from a, a tipster. Um, and incredibly, all of these materials uh, were publicly available. Yep, and we'll show they're, the site here they're, shortly. They're not hiding it. Yep. Um, and they had, you know, self-pleasure workshops yep. that included people between the ages of 13 and 40. Gosh. Um, listen, I'm 37. If you're a 37-year-old man and you're doing a masturbation workshop with a 13-year-old, um, the, the, the normal reaction you're is to of. run away as yeah. fast as possible because that's perverted. You can't, you should not be doing that. And, 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 and so it's like these things kind of like blow your hair back. Mm -hmm. And this is supported by major regional philanthropies. There's money from charities going into this kind of program. Uh, they've done dozens of them over the course of about, uh, uh, I think, 12, 10 years now. Um, flying under the radar. Uh, and, and, and they have their agenda, their syllabus of their activities. It's mental. Like you're teaching a 13 year old how to do illegal drugs and have sex. Like, no, you think, thank you. You yeah. think most of the parents know that this is going on at these camps when they send? This I is just. I couldn't assumption. confirm. I couldn't right. confirm. I've been trying to confirm that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, my instinct, which I uh, have been unable to verify completely, uh, my my hunch from some of the materials um, is that some of these were a bit more eman emancipated minors, mm -hmm. so people doing it without their. Uh, mm -hmm. parents consent but understood yeah it seems like it because they are very open about exactly what it is that they're teaching at this camp as a yeah. parent i can't imagine you send your kid and you don't know that this is where they're going you would hope not yeah and it's if i remember correctly and i could have this detail wrong maybe i'm confusing it but i think this is correct um i think they were also targeting like foster kids <sighs> um and look foster kids are 
the most vulnerable group uh, in our society, mm -hmm. extremely high rates of abuse. And when you see someone going after a kind of very vulnerable population of minors, it just gives you that feeling on the back of your neck that something is really wrong here. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, foster kids have a tough road, you know, uh, a very tough road, very difficult uh, circumstances, very uh, pessimistic outcomes. Um, and so it's like, I don't know. It so, really does seem that a lot of times these things are taking kids who are uh, um, uh, vulnerable, impressionable, mm -hmm. and then playing out political fantasies. Right. Look at the bios of these people. They're, yeah. you know. Oh, it's terrible. The they're bios insane. are outrageous. They are it's outrageous. Like, yeah, they're, they're witches. witches. One identifies as a witch. witch. I mean, yeah. how, how do we shut this place down? I mean, how do we make it so that these types of places no longer exist? They shouldn't exist. I mean, I, I, I would say that in this case, uh, it probably would warrant some kind of investigation, right? Yeah, definitely. I don't oh, know. 100%. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of the And imagine if they were men. I mean, imagine if there were a bunch of, you know, adult men running sexy self pleasure uh, workshops with children. I mean, right. those men would be in jail immediately. Right. I mean, there would be, you know, pitchforks out. Um, but for some reason, I don't know what it is. I, I guess female educator they get kind of a pass i'm not really sure what it is I, yeah so i guess that else. is what it is people don't view women as being capable of, of committing this type of abuse predators they're not they're like oh they're women they're not predators right yeah. they must be caring they must be nurturing and you you hark on like a very important point and that is trying to get foster kids and things like that if if that is uh true in this case is that they manipulate and exploit the most vulnerable parts of our society and which is children because if you can convince children of this at a really early age that's going to stick uh and for me it took a lot i used to be a super super radical leftist everybody who watches this knows this yeah we know uh yeah so <laughs> ever since i was a, a wee child i was taught these things and it really does stick to you the younger and younger you can get these ideas placed in the brain so much so that you have uh teachers now saying you know if your parents don't accept you for your your gender identity or who you are who you choose to identify as i'm your new parent uh we no. yeah we reacted to a video of a teacher who had a transition closet in his classroom for kids whose parents would not let them go to school in the clothes that they wanted. They could change in his room into girls' clothes for for the boys, into boys' clothes for the girls. Yeah. Again, you're an adult. You're a public school employee, maybe. Yes. Um, you are having a special secret room where children can take their clothes off. Yeah. Bro, what are you doing? Yeah. That is insane. <laughs> like insane. we should be immediately like, and it has nothing to do even with transgender. It's like. In any, uh, no matter what the orientation or the ideology is, like that is crazy town. Yes. Right. That is crazy town. Like I would, you should be, I, I just don't understand the mindset of people. Like there are certain things that as an adult, as a parent, you see and you say, I want to be as far away from that as possible. That's nuts. Mm -hmm. And then you're a public employee. Like You should be gone immediately. Right. Of if course. you're running a, a secret naked closet with your students or and whatever. And he's making TikToks yeah. about how wonderful it is that he's doing this for his children and how like he's going to be their new parent. He's the, the beacon yeah. of, of freedom in this in this school. They have the rubber rooms with those teachers, some of them, <laughs> you know, right. where you can't get fired. You just go, you sexually abuse right, a kid right. and now you go to one of these rubber yeah. rooms because the union can't get rid of you. They feel protected. Problem. Yeah, they feel protected in being able to do this. Uh, I saw a video, of, we, we reacted to a video this past Tuesday of a teacher saying, you know, if I get moved from my school or fired from my school for uh, teaching critical race theory, I know there's a shortage in teachers. I'm just going to go somewhere else and I'm going to do the same thing and I'm protected by the union. So there's nothing you can do to stop me. Burn it all down. <laughs> yeah, you know, I feel like I'm getting to the point where it's like, well, I think we need more than just uh you think you yeah. think you're sounding like Will. the public schools. You sound like no, I, I'm a I'm a softy. You're you're yeah. more hardcore than I am. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean I, I think look, public schools are going to be part of our society okay. for the long term. You can't abandon the public schools, you can't wish them away. Um and, and We're in, just talking in, best case and in most cases no. And, no, no, I'm telling best you, and, case scenario. and in most cases uh, a, a lot of public schools are actually still very good schools. Yep. What you really need is deep reform. You have to have deep reform. You need new personnel, new management, new laws. Um and so I I I, I, I tease about sometimes you're like, Oh my god, get rid of it um with all these institutions. But but look, I'm a believer and I'm a be believer in decentralized control. So I want every local community to have much better and, and all the parents in that community to have total ownership of their institutions. Mm -hmm. So that look, if you want a crazy curriculum in Berkeley or Brooklyn, 
all power to you. You can do CRT, you can do gender ideology, you can do whatever you want. This is a free country. But you shouldn't be a parent in a, let's say a conservative district or a suburban district of Dallas or, or, or the Valley or whatever, and then have this forced onto you against the consent of parents and students. That yeah. to me is not, not good. It kind of yeah. sounds like that grandfather's ax paradox, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know that one. So it's essentially that you have an ax and then eventually you have to replace the handle because it gets wear down. Then you have to replace the screw on it and then you have to replace the steel for the ax. And it's like, is it still your grandfather's ax? Or is it a totally new ax because you replaced everything? That's so like awesome. you were talking yeah. about with the public schools, you change every single thing about it. It's I think kind it's of like, like the like ship you of Theseus it. or yes, something exactly. like that, right? It's like yeah, it's the, the same metaphor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's great. And I think that that is maybe that. Yeah. yeah. So in the it's sense- It's like replace everything. You replace everything <laughs> and then is it the same? I don't yeah. know, man. Yeah. It's like, it's like, that's like a bong rip kind of question. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Like, it's like, oh, bro, is it even like the same shit, bro? Like the ax? It's 320 right now? Yeah. Which is perfect. Yeah. That's what that is. Are people in Denver, it's 420 Oh, bro. I'm not even sure that's an ax anymore, man. I gotta shave me. I gotta shave throw in me. here our uh, our favorite thirteen year old fan Asher, who's Asher. been all over the chat this week, just said in all caps, "Abolish the public schools." All like, right, that Asher, youthful no. energy. So he's with that you, Will. Energy. We're going straight to the this source. This is Will. Yeah. Asher, we got this intellectual guy. What does he know? This do is an not. Actual student, this is a, yeah. you know? oh, do not yeah, let Will going. indoctrinate you into the abolish the public schools yeah. movement. <laughs> this is not indoctrination. This is. This is peer pressure. Grandfather's yeah, acts yeah. the public schools. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I know a lot of you are watching this and you're like, wow, Chris Rufo is so smart. Right, Chris? I don't know about that. <laughs> My wife tells me that otherwise. Yeah. 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 As she should. As she should. As yeah. she it's should. important. Yeah, it's an important before, function. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Humble you. <laughs> Um, Go take out the trash. Exactly. Yeah. Take yourself it's out. It's actually awesome. I'll tell you guys. It's a funny thing. Like, uh, I'll like go on, on TV uh, from the home studio that I built. Mm -hmm. I'll be on Tucker Carlson. Yo, four million people. Like we do them all the time. She's like, yeah, cool. Take out the trash. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I appreciate that actually. Yeah. She's like, you're not going to get a big head in my house. Right. So I was like, all right, that's fair. <laughs> you're like, honey, John Oliver just talked about me for 30 minutes and five million people She was worried about that it. one. She's like, oh, what, is he, what are they doing over there? She's like, that one was, she's like, that's not bad. She's like, that was fine. Yeah. Well, she's that's proud amazing. Of you. She's proud. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I bet. Is, yeah. I bet. Uh, and a lot of people are going to be proud because guess what? PragerU is taking on Christopher Rufo. Uh, let's let's play this short clip of Joy Reid basically attacking you for, for nine minutes. So we're going to show a little segment of that and what she calls Christopher Rufo theory. Their classrooms. I actually appreciate that you said that because, Christopher, what you basically, and, and you admit it yourself, that you've False. taken all of these sort of wokeness moments, corporate wokeness, uh, the corporate sort of woke money, woke capital, the things that annoy conservatives, and you've stuffed it all into the name critical race theory. It's really like, it's it's like Christopher Rufo theory. You stuffed it up. <laughs> so good. I love it. <laughs> Even at the moment, I uh -huh. was like, damn, that's, that's a good one. Good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, fair play. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And she's not necessarily wrong. I mean, look, uh, uh, you can take uh, how language works and how how politics works is, there's always someone reconceptualizing or reorganizing or 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 re-envisioning. I mean, it's a constant generative and creative process. And so I take Christopher Rufo theory not as an in, it's designed as an insult, right? Mm -hmm. But I really don't take it that way because it's like, yes, I applied my own mind to this problem. I came up with my own solution to this problem mm -hmm. and got it done. And so therefore, Christopher Rufo theory has been a very successful theory. Mm -hmm. um, arguably, and I think the evidence weighs in my favor, more successful than critical race theory itself. And so a lot of times these folks attack you um, without even realizing that they're paying you an unintended compliment. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I about, love it. They talk about World War Three with Ukraine. It's Will Witt Three. Oh, <laughs> that's right. You know, that's all three. Yeah, that's right. You know? <laughs> Thank you. The third coming. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsey Graham. Yeah. Appreciate it. But uh, we're, we're moving forward with with Joy's sort of moniker of Christopher Rufo theory and creating a show for you here at PragerU. Do you kind of want to talk about what the show is going to be about? Yeah, this is a, a very exciting uh, moment and excited to be now a new colleague of yours. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be a uh, twice monthly uh, video show, also distributed on podcast platforms. And I'm going to take a deep dive into some facet of what I think of as America's cultural revolution. Um, because what I've learned is that Americans intuitively have a sense that something has gone wrong 
in our institutions, but they don't know the genealogy. They mm. don't know where it comes from. They don't know how it operates. They don't know how to talk about it. And so the show is going to be uh, each episode, a deep kind of 45 minutes to an hour dive into some topic. Mm -hmm. You know, how does critical race theory work? Um, how does uh, how does how do institutions get captured? What's the history of the left wing cultural revolution since 1968? How does brainwashing work? What specific techniques and mechanisms does it work by? And all of these topics um, we're going to be exploring. Um, and uh, and I thought that when we're thinking about the show, it's like there's no better name than Christopher Rufo theory. Right. You have the Ben Shapiro show, you have the Joe Rogan experience, mm -hmm. and then you have the Christopher Rufo theory. <laughs> um, it, it has the right connotations. Yeah. It has kind of intellectual. It's uh, it, 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 it suggests some kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. um, it has my name in it, obviously, so it's easily so, so, recognizable. Yeah, there you go. But also it... it um, it absorbs the critique and owns it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think uh, for me has been really fun is all these people attack so mad and, and, and yelling at me on TV or whatever. Um, and it's like, I love it. It's part of the fun. It's like the, the fight is so great. It's like, I would be, I'd be disappointed if, you know, all of my friends uh, and, and uh, you know, frenemies or whatever they are, mm -hmm. um, you know, didn't come after me. And so um, it's an homage to my, to my enemies. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's a, a good kind of, a way of thinking about the future. That's fantastic. You judge your accomplishments by the enemies you've made. That's right. Yeah. You got to have good ones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The better your enemies, the better you are. Who, who are your arch enemies? You guys have any specific Ooh. people? Yeah. I don't make a lot of enemies. <laughs> You've been too Will, nice, though. That's like, right. I, I, I am, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the compassionate arm yeah. of this yeah. operation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's keeping the thing on the on the rails. <laughs> right. She's like, we got to <laughs> dial it in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Samantha B. Oh, yeah. Um, Samantha B. Samantha B. Much what, what's the guy's name? Sam, who does the leftist? Oh, uh, that guy. Uh, yeah, what's his name? Sam. Uh, uh, Sam Cedar. Yes, I, I, and, and I've never has, seen his has, stuff, but yeah. I see his name all the time. Oh, he's Vouch got, hates us. Yeah, he and then us. he's oh, got these guy. other guys within his podcast thing that always are quote tweeting me and all this stuff. It's great. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so oh, that makes sense because you, know. you guys are like the, there's that that the left wing live streaming mm -hmm. world is a pretty big. It's big. I mean, it's yeah. big, man. Yeah, Hassan and Vouch and yeah. Shoe, some of those ones, yeah. Who's Shoe? She's this this woman who does it. Wow. Okay, I think I've seen her. I think <laughs> I've it's, it's, it's the lady who has shoe on head. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah. I've exactly. seen that, but I haven't seen any of the videos. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we'll, you'll be making more enemies just oh, by joining geez. us. Oh, Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, I think you're doing fine with joining us. Oh uh, yeah, you want some help. I'll trade. Yeah, I'll yeah, trade. Yeah. Well, the thing is, don't take it ever too personally. No, you can't. Yeah, you can't. No, right? Because it's all ideological. Yeah, it's a game. It's like a video game. You know, a lot of this stuff is postmodern, right? Where it's like uh, it doesn't exist uh, in, in in a certain sense. Where it's like w when I'm, you know, fighting with someone on TV, and then I'm taking out the trash, which is my real life. Right. Yeah. Taking out the trash is kind of my real life. Yeah. You know. Right. So, well, because that's my real life, and this is the kind of avatar life in yeah. some ways. Yeah. It's a one way of health, keeping a healthy distance from it. That is that's a good exactly way to look right. at it. Yeah, because oh, yeah, a lot of people ask, how do I keep myself separated from all this stuff? It's really stressing me out. That's a very good way to, yeah, very good way to look at things. Just and judging what's important. Yeah. yeah, like the thing that your enemies say doesn't keep you up at night. You know, no, it can't. Yeah. No, yeah, it, it can't. can't. Mm -mm. It can't. Sometimes it's funny, actually. Yeah. Well, no, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it keeps good. you up. Sometimes it's like, damn, that was a good yeah. one. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> I keeps wouldn't you admit up, it like, in the, in the moment, it. but I'm like, all right, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> good work. Yeah, I think Chris Rufo is the upper echelon of that. That's fantastic. Man, yeah. You're really on fire, man. You, you guys are, are doing too. great work. You guys are too, honestly. And we're now colleagues. Yes, we are. That's cool. That's, yeah. that's pretty. That's a yeah. pretty dream team, right there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm. I'm yeah. excited to see what's happening. And you guys are going to be armed because so often we talk about these issues, and you know, you guys want to have these conversations, but you're staying silent because you don't know exactly what to say or how to say it. Chris is going to be helping you. With I'm going to give you the, the. And that's another thing I want to do with the show is arm people with that information mm -hmm. and the language. Yep. And so they can feel confident in speaking out, and they could be high school kids or college kids or mm -hmm. young adults or parents um, or grandparents, whatever. Um, the range of people who they, they have common sense, but they feel intimidated in some respect by the, by the kind of fake language that we live in, you mm -hmm. know? Yep. And we need to give those people the tools to push back. You guys are doing it, you know? Prager, you certainly does it. I mean, mm -hmm. has done it on every topic imaginable yeah. with the five-minute videos. And then this is going to be another 
another angle on it, another another facet of it to try to help people. Yeah. Yep, we are here to help you in joining the fight. And ladies and gentlemen, I think that sums up our show for today. Leave a comment down below today. What's a topic or subject matter that you want to see? Ooh, that's a good Chris yeah. cover. What are you lacking in information on? And what do you not know how to battle? And Christopher Rufo hopefully will cover that on his new show, Christopher Rufo Theory. That's going to be here at PragerU. If you want to be here when that show comes out, download the PragerU app or go to the PragerU website at PragerU.com. And when it comes out, you'll be able to just click browse, watch, and there it will be. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for being on. The thank show. you. The thank people you. who are watching do have to understand. I'm not sure if people understand the gravity of how important you have been to this movement. Yep. That without you, all these things we talk about would not be possible. True. All oh, right. I appreciate that. That's very flattering. Yep. Thank it's, you. It is not flattering. Yeah. It's just really the truth. People have to understand that there are warriors out there fighting for this stuff, and you're yeah. one of them. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a big deal. Yeah. You know, to put yourself on the line. Yeah, and we'll get it. It's fun, and uh, and look, you know, we're we're winning, yes, and we that's are. the thing. We're absolutely winning. We're absolutely making progress. We've rallied political leaders mm -hmm. um, to get that substantive agenda together. Um, and for us, we're just getting started. Yes. Damn right. Awesome, ladies and gentlemen. And we will be back on Monday with our show at 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern with some hot topics and dear Will and Amala. We will see you guys then. Bye. See ya.